Welcome to another virtual biology lecture. Today we're going to be discussing passive and active transports. Hope you guys enjoy and don't forget to take good notes. Today's virtual lecture's objective is to become familiar with the following assessment standard from reporting category one that's going to be tested on the STAR biology EOC. At the end of the lecture, you should be able to explain homeostasis and the transport of molecules as well as the different biomolecules involved in a cell membrane. Now that you're familiar with what cells look like, it's important that you understand that cells are constantly interacting with their environments within the organism. All living things must maintain a stable internal environment in order to function properly. The process by which organisms keep these internal conditions relatively stable, regardless of those changes in the external conditions, is actually called homeostasis. The exact conditions that an organism needs vary from organism to organism. If homeostasis is disrupted in a major way, however, the organism may die. Living things maintain homeostasis in various ways. For the most part, homeostasis begins at the cellular level, in which cells must maintain internal stable environments by controlling what goes in and out of the cell. As we have previously discussed, this is the job for the cell membrane, which is a selectively permeable phospholipid bilayer surrounding the cell, which helps regulate homeostasis by being selective in what materials enter and exit the cell. The cell membrane has two phospholipid layers, thus the name phospholipid bilayer, bi meaning two layers. Remember that phospholipids have a hydrophilic polar head and a hydrophobic nonpolar tail, which helps in its selectivity. Okay, so let's think why is this important? Well, cells need to move molecules and nutrients across its membrane to carry out functions needed for life, and they must also release waste. Sometimes the cell must use energy to move materials across the cell membrane. Other times, substances move across the cell membrane without using any energy. The movement of materials into or out of the cell without the expenditure of energy is actually called passive transport, and the movement which does require energy is called active transport. The most common form of passive transport used in the cell is known as diffusion. So what is diffusion? Well, diffusion is a form of passive transport because it doesn't require any energy to move molecules. And it moves molecules from where there's a lot, which is actually referred as the area of higher concentration, to where there's only a few, which is the area of lower concentration, without requiring any energy at all. For instance, nonpolar small molecules such as oxygen and carbon dioxide can easily pass through the semipermeable membrane, and they do so with what we call simple diffusion, in which they go from a crowded area to a less crowded area. Basically, they're moving with the concentration gradient from high to low concentration. Now, particles are going to continue to diffuse into and out of the cell until their concentration is the same on both sides of the cell membrane. When particles reach the state of equal concentration, the system is at equilibrium. Once equilibrium is reached, particles continue to diffuse across the cell membrane in both directions without changing its concentration. It's important to note that not all particles can diffuse across the cell membrane. Remember, Remember, this is why it's referred as a selectively permeable membrane, which only allows some particles to pass through it. Water molecules are small and can easily diffuse through the cell membrane. Now, water is extremely important to life, and most cells are composed primarily of water, which is why the diffusion of water across the selectively permeable membrane has its own name for this specific form of passive transport, which is actually called osmosis. Osmosis is the movement of water molecules through the membrane from a place of higher concentration to a place of lower concentration. Overall, water may move either into or out of the cell by osmosis. The difference in concentrations on opposite sides of a cell membrane makes osmosis possible. This difference is known as the concentration gradient. Transports of molecules may be referred as with or down with the concentration gradient, meaning it moves from high to low concentration or they're said to go against the concentration gradient, which is from low to high concentrations. Osmosis, for instance, is a passive transport of water molecules and it moves with the concentration gradient, meaning from high to low concentrations. Okay, so let's take a look at this image. Let's say that the cell's environment is on the left and its surrounding environment is on the right. 
That means that the concentration gradient between a cell and its surroundings, the outside solution on the right, will be referred as either hypertonic or hypotonic solution. Okay, but before we decide which type of solution this is, we first need to understand a couple of key descriptors. For instance, we say that water concentration is 100%, where we're actually stating that the solution only has water, meaning pure water, nothing else in it. Now, that's not always the case. Water usually has other things dissolved in it. We call these solutes, such as sugar, salt, or basically any particles that will dissolve in water. Okay, so let's say that this solution did have some solutes present, such as these sugar molecules in red. Well, our solution will no longer be 100% water because it has solutes in it. Now, the solution is made up of perhaps 90% water and 10% sugar solutes. Overall, this is what we mean when we describe the solutions as having high water concentration or high solute concentration. We're actually talking about the percentage of water and the percentage of solutes that are found in that solution. Okay, so let's take a look at some examples. Notice that the solution in the left, which is the inside of the cell, has a lot of sugar molecules, which are the red solutes, and very little water, which are the blue molecules. So we could say that it has about 40% water and 60% solutes. Okay, now let's look at the solution on the right, which is the outside of the cell. In this solution, we have very little solutes and more water molecules. So we could say that we have 90% water and 10% solutes. Now some of you may be thinking, where is she getting these percentages? Well, these are just estimates based on looking at these amounts present in the solutions. We don't really write out any of these values anywhere. They're just meant to help you visualize whether or not the water or the solute concentration is higher or lower in each solution. So based on our estimated percentages, what do you think? Does the solution on the left have higher or lower water concentration? Well, we said that about 40% is the water concentration, so we would say a lower water concentration is present here. Now, the solution on the right has higher water concentration of about 90%. The solid concentration, however, would be the opposite on the left. It's actually a higher concentration of solutes, and on the right, it has a lower concentration of solutes. Remember we said that osmosis is the movement of water from high to low concentrations. Therefore, Therefore, water in this example would move into the cell until it reaches equilibrium of water concentration between the cell and the outside of the cell. It's important that you understand that osmosis is only the movement of water. The solutes do not move. Okay, so let's look at the previous example again. We said that the solution on the left is the cell, which in this case has high water concentration, and the solution on the right is the outside of the cell, and it has low water concentration. As for the solute concentration of sugar, it's the opposite, in which the cell has low sugar concentration, and the outside of the cell has high sugar concentration. Why is all of this important, and how does this relate to the type of solution in the outside of the cell? Well, as we mentioned before, the outside of the cell can be described as a hypotonic or a hypertonic. A solution outside of the cell with a high solute concentration, as seen in our example here, is referred as a hypertonic solution, which means that water will move out of the cell in order to reach equilibrium, which will result in the cell to shrivel up such as this red blood cell, or in this case, the plant cell, where the cytoplasm shrinks from the cell wall. Now, if the solution outside the cell has a low solute concentration, then it's referred as a hypotonic solution, which means that water will move into the cell in order to reach equilibrium, which will result in the cell to swell up and possibly burst. I always remember this term and its result as hypo, similar to hippo, meaning that it's gonna swell up like a hippo, such as this red blood cell here. And another example is this plant cell that has a huge vacuole ready to burst. Now, this isn't always the case where a cell will either shrivel or burst. In fact, cells normally are maintained in a balanced environment in the body, where the solutions are of equal concentrations both inside and outside of the cells. We call these isotonic solutions. Isotonic solutions are a balanced environment for a cell in which equal amounts of water move into and out of the cell, allowing the cell to maintain its healthy shape, such as these red blood cells and this plant cell. 
Remember that we mentioned that the cell membrane was often referred as a mosaic because of all the colorful proteins found inside of it. Well, let's take a look at what some of those proteins may be used for. In fact, many of these proteins are actually transport proteins, which help transport molecules across the membrane. Now, there are two types of transport proteins. The first are protein channels, which are basically water-filled channels or pores that allow some molecules to pass into and out of the cell. These pores are selective though. That means that they only allow some kinds of substances to pass through the membrane, such as seen in this animation. There are even some special protein channels called aquaporins, which only allow the movement of water, which helps reach equilibrium during osmosis. Now, the second type of transport proteins is a carrier protein, which are very specific to the type of substance that they carry. These proteins bind with substances on one side of the cell membrane and then release them on the other side of the membrane. Now, keep in mind that these proteins only allow this transport to take place when there's a difference in concentration on both sides of the cell membrane. Overall, facilitated diffusion is the movement of substances across the cell membrane from high to low concentration with the aid of protein channels and or carrier proteins which are embedded in the cell membrane. Overall, passive transport consists of three different forms of transport, simple diffusion, osmosis, and facilitated diffusion. Remember that osmosis refers specifically to the movement of water based on the type of solute concentration found outside of the cell, and facilitated diffusion uses either protein channels or carrier proteins to transport certain substances across the cell membrane. But overall, all three forms of passive transport move substances from high to low concentrations across the cell membrane without using any energy at all. Now, let's take a look at active transport, because unlike passive transport, active transport does require energy to move materials across the cell membrane, specifically because it moves them against the concentration gradient, meaning from low to high concentrations. Moving material against the concentration gradient causes energy to be required and makes use of proteins in the cell membrane known as active transport proteins. Now, these proteins differ from those seen in the facilitated diffusion because in active transport proteins, the substance being transported binds to the protein and is transported only when ATP, which is a form of energy, is bonded to the protein as well. One example of this is the sodium-potassium pump. Sodium ions are pumped out of the cell and potassium ions are pumped into the cell by specific channel proteins which require energy in order to move these ions. Now, it's important to note that the cell also uses energy to move a large substance or a large amount of a substance in vesicles. Remember from our previous lecture, transport vesicles form from the cell membrane itself similar to these animations. Now, transport vesicles are used for allowing substances to enter or exit the cell without actually crossing the cell membrane itself. For instance, when substances are taken into the cell through a transport vesicle, we call this process endocytosis. Just remember, endo sounds like entering. There are also different types of endocytosis. For instance, when the cell engulfs a large particle, we call this type of endocytosis as phagocytosis, which means cell eating. Overall, you just need to remember that endocytosis is the process in which the cell membrane forms a pocket around the substance that will be transported into the cell, and then once inside, the pocket breaks off into a transport vesicle, and eventually it releases the needed materials into the cell. Okay, so what about when a substance is being removed from the cell, meaning exiting the cell? Well, we call this process exocytosis, so remember, exo, which sounds like exiting. During exocytosis, the membrane of a transport vesicle fuses with the cell membrane, which causes all of the unwanted materials to be removed from the cell. Overall, you need to remember that both endocytosis and exocytosis are types of transports which require energy. Therefore, these are also forms of active transport. Okay, so let's take a look at the big picture because homeostasis is maintained by individual cells through the control in their transport of materials into and out of the cell membrane through passive and active transports. Make note that passive transport does not require energy to move materials with the concentration gradient across the cell membrane. Now, active transport, on the other hand, does require energy because it moves materials against the concentration gradient across the cell membrane. Overall, cells must make
maintain a state of homeostasis, but it's important to note that multicellular organisms also must maintain stable conditions within the entire organism. Often, this requires the integrated response from many cells found in many organs and organ systems. Overall, cells, organs, and organ systems all work together to maintain homeostasis of the entire organism. For instance, your body stays close to the normal body temperature of 98.6, whether you're sledding in the snowstorm or playing basketball in an overheated gym. Your body temperature is controlled by the part of the brain called the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus senses the temperature of your body, and if it's not a certain range, the hypothalamus starts a chain reaction that causes changes in your body to help either warm or cool it off. Now, as you probably figure, this chain reaction is going to cause cells, organs, and organ systems to all work together so that they can reach a state of homeostasis so that that body temperature stays at its normal range. Okay, now that we've gone over homeostasis and the various transports used in the cell membrane with the help of certain biomolecules found in it, you should be familiar with the following assessment standard from reporting category 1. All right, guys, this concludes our virtual biology lecture on passive and active transport. I hope you all took great notes and wrote down any questions or concerns that you may have so that we can discuss them in class. Well, that's it. Have a great one. All right, stop. Collaborate and listen.